Thank you for waking up early on a Saturday morning to talk about poop. <laughs> You're a brave audience. Um, Okay, let's just move right into it. People usually want to know, like, okay, just tell me what you're going to tell me so if I fall asleep, I know what I had to learn. Um, So in the beginning, we'll talk about, you know, what is, I mean, we all think we know the definition of a constipation, but there's actually some technical definitions. Who does it affect? Everybody probably sometime in their life. Uh, If anybody has a poop joke at any time, please uh, go right ahead join in. Why should you care about this subject? We'll talk about that. And um, basically, should you worry about it? And where can you get help if it affects you? And always, nobody really knows what the poop emoji really stands for. Just to let you know, you can use this emoji. Does everybody know what an emoji is? You all text, right? Yeah, okay. (laughs) And um, you're free to use it as you would like. Actually, you know, we're always learning new things. Every time I come and I give a new lecture, I'm like, I have to review. You know, I'm nervous because we're always learning more things. And just yesterday, I was talking to Kamal because I get like an email alert from a group called Medscape. And just as I thought, okay, I'm caught up. I've read about, you know, the new things. Um, There was a brand new study that came out that looked at who they were looking at who gets constipated? And they looked at something like 17,000 people, and um, it was women more than men. And Kamal and I were just talking about, you know, why we think that might be. Well, first of all, constipation is one of the most common digestive complaints in the United States. And since digestive complaints are anything to do with the gastro, stomach, intestinal, intestine system. So we call that the GI system, gastrointestinal. Anything to do with the GI system is going to be one of the most common complaints of anybody anywhere, right? I'm always telling like my students and my, my residents when they're getting ready to take board exams, I said, if they ask a question on the boards about adverse effects, a negative effect from medication, the answer is GI. The answer is either constipation or diarrhea or nausea, right? The most common thing from any, right? Or a side effect even of a disease. Anything that affects the human body oftentimes affects the GI system. Okay, so... If we looked at overall population, probably 15% of people might be affected at any one time, but certain times of life are certainly more um, uh, predisposed to having constipation. So I think most people get the sense that as we get older, we're going to be more constipated. And like I said, women tend to be more constipated, and you can think about that they through their life cycle, often go through a lot of changes. So has anybody in the audience ever been pregnant? You don't have to raise your hands. Um, I'll speak for myself, and you can just smile underneath your mask if you want, that pregnancy, any kind of condition that, like, makes things kind of loosen up, you know, so that it's not as toned, is going to make you more constipated. So pregnancy is going to be a time of life, as, as we call it in med school, a sexually transmitted disease that, um, that, um, that will make you more constipated. So um, we know that as we don't move around as much and as we age, constipation can become more frequent, and that's why laxatives are used by about 18% of older people in the community, but 74% of people who live in a nursing home. And like I said, women to men, you know, way more common. And that's probably things we talked about, hormonal changes throughout life. And the sad thing that I read about yesterday was that they think it's also because women report stress more often than men. That um, I guess men, you know, I can't make fun of them because they're half my audience. But... um, (laughs) But, you know, I think women tend to be, you know, taking care of a lot of things and worrying and be the people who, like, you know, think about or maybe overthink, if you ask a man. Okay. I just want to say, 
any questions, any concerns, if I'm talking too fast, too slow, too New York of an accent, if you have, just interrupt. I'd like this to be, I'm sorry for my audience, my, my audience at home in America that um, I guess they could chat. They could put a question in the chat and Kamal could interrupt me. And if anybody here in the room has a comment, a question, a remark, you know, let's make this interactive if you want. Okay. So is this where I am already? Okay. So like I said, there's a, we all kind of know constipation when we see it. It's like that, I can't talk about it. That was that, remember there was that, forget it, I'm moving on. Um, but, uh, but we do, we like to define things carefully in medicine. And so there's a criteria called the Rome 4 criteria. And they say that the definition is if there's less than or equal to three stools per week, if the person has to strain more than 25% of the time, the passage of hard, dry, or lumpy stools greater than 25%. Yeah, hard, dry, lumpy stools. So I'm driving here, and my friend Steve calls me because we talk on the phone on Saturday mornings. And he goes, remember that story you told me in med school, from med school? And I said, no, because we've known each other for like 50 years, so I don't remember every story. And he told me this story. He reminded me. So I had this professor who, like, came late to a lecture, and he says, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, Wait, hold on. I'm going to ruin my punchline. I have to remember what. I can't, I can't remember my punchline. But it was something like this. And he says, I was having, like I, like, I ate something bad, and I was having terrible diarrhea, and it was, like, really, like, liquidy but sort of mucusy. And it, like, it was, like, just, like, floating on top of the bowl. It was coming out, like, and he said, and it was horribly smelling. He goes, but I don't want to give you too much information. <laughs> so I, I do need the disclaimer is we are going to be talking about poop. So we are going to be, say, using words like lumpy, dry, you know, hard, sticky, you know, whatever. Luckily, we won't be talking about diarrhea. So we won't be saying mucusy or, you know, slimy or anything like that. So that's the good news. Okay, more of the Rome 4 criteria. You can see you feel like you can't get it all out, like there's still something in there, or maybe you feel blocked. Um, you might, some people might need to be manually disimpacted or manually, dis manually meaning like your hand, fingers, were digitally disimpacted. I know that sounds really horrible, but I have to say, this is like half my job, and um, this is what has made me like famous and allows me to lead the glamorous life that I lead. Um, so don't make fun of manual disimpaction. So okay, my okay. So stools. Uh, if you can't poop without using a laxative, and also that. You don't have IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. So what is I, well, okay, also constipation or anything in medicine, we like to talk about whether it's acute or chronic. Acute meaning kind of new, chronic, you know, more than six months or lifelong kind of thing. Uh, uh, acute constipation is transient, just part of life, you know what I mean? You, you were traveling or, you know, somebody's guava tree, you know, was like fruiting and you ate like a whole bunch of guavas or something. Um, so some people say, well, it takes me a really long time to sit there and squeeze out the poop. So some people have defined constipation. If you need to sit for that long, please don't sit for this long, I have to say. This, I don't want anybody sitting on the toilet for this long. You can actually like, you'll give yourself hemorrhoids and you'll get other problems or prolapse. Just if it's taking more than a few minutes, we, we need a new plan. Sitting there longer is not the plan. Um, this is um, the Bristol stool chart. And actually, even though it looks silly, we actually use this in medicine to help people describe what their poops look like. This is the one that was also, uh, we use for little kids too, hence the little eyeballs 
like in the, you know, anytime you want it to be for kids, you put eyeballs on things, I guess. And um, so we can describe stools in the, in your medical chart, or you can describe it to us if it looks like rabbit droppings or a bunch of grapes or corn on the cob's my favorite. I don't know why, but I just think it, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is different than a corn poop. Corn poop is when it doesn't, this is the actual poop, right? I heard somebody in the audience, thank you, thank you very much, see, to say Thanksgiving. When you eat corn and it actually comes out unchewed, that's actually just corn. Um, this is this is corn on the cob uh, um, visual for your poop. Um, and obviously, like, the ones in the middle range are, are kind of normal, and the ones on the this range are more like constipation, and the seven and gravy is more like diarrhea. Um, I have to say, why does poop interest me? Why do I even care about this subject? And why does constipation especially interest me? Um, when I was a fellow in geriatrics, um, my very, very, very first rotation, uh, I had to go to a hospital. I won't say what hospital it was. And I was sent there, and I get there, and they say, okay, Sherry, you've got a new consult to see. There's a new case for you to see. And they want you to determine whether or not this patient has the capacity to make decisions. Okay? They sent me off to the hospital, and they said, This patient's been really confused, and it's your job to see whether they're able to understand the issues and make decisions. I said, okay, that sounds good. I I can I can do that. And off I go, and I learn the story, and apparently it was an older gentleman, and he got admitted to the hospital, and then he stopped eating. He refused to eat. And they tried to encourage him to eat. They tried, and he was getting more and more confused, and they put a feeding tube down, in through his nose, down the back of his throat, into his stomach to give him liquid nutrition. Granted, nobody likes this, but this guy kept reaching and grabbing and pulling it out without explaining, you know, without talking about it. He's just like, get this out, get this out, and pulling it out. So his children got involved because the... Uh, the nurses said, we're going to have to tie him up because he keeps pulling out this feeding tube and he won't eat. And the son was saying, he doesn't want it. He's telling you he doesn't want it. Take it out. Don't tie him up. And the daughter was saying, he's going to die if you don't artificially feed him. He doesn't know what he's saying at this point. You have to keep feeding him, right? Right. And I'm sure people here might have views on whether we should continue to artificially feed him or whether we should follow what seems to be his maybe implicit orders to take out the tube, right? Okay, so I went, I see him, I do my evaluation. And because I was like a new fellow and I'm all very gung-ho and everything, you know, and I'm going to do a really good job, I do a full physical exam, including a rectal exam, right? Because I was taught there's only two reasons to not do a rectal exam. Anybody know what the two reasons are? The patient doesn't have a rectum or you don't have any fingers. So, <laughs> so I do my rectal exam and boom, 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 boom. I hit, what am I hitting in his rectum? Boom. He, poop. Hard, dry, stuck in there poop and it had been stuck in there for so long that he didn't want to eat anymore and it was starting to make him confused so I for five cents I put on a glove and got a bunch of lube and I pulled the poop out of his butt and went home to write my note and go back the next day, and he looks at me, and he's like, good morning. Hey, I hear that you you helped me out yesterday. 
And he was eating and thinking and talking, and I didn't have to do a capacity evaluation anymore. Thank you. And ever since then, I'm like, this is super important. This is super important. And... Um, and what happens in the stomach and the gut affects everything. And that was an extreme example, but I don't want it getting to an extreme example anymore for, you know, people I care about. Um, anyway, so that story, let that story stick in your head. Anyway, um, Red flags. When, when do I really worry about constipation, right? Because like I said, 15% of the population at any one time, like, like half of any of us at any one time as we get older, you know, on average. So it's not always an emergency, right? We don't need to run off to the, you know, the emergency room because we're constipated. But there are certain things that mm, should be like warning signs that it's a problem, Okay, so remember we talked about acute and chronic? Like if somebody's had chronic constipation all their life, like you don't need to all of a sudden worry like this is indicative of a, like a, a serious illness. But if someone does get all of a sudden new constipation, especially like after the age of 50, you would want to kind of investigate like why? Why is that happening? Or all of a sudden there's a new change in stool character color. Um, you know, because as we get older, we worry this one. Anybody know what I'm worried particularly? Whoops, sorry, let's go back. Go back. Um, um, rectal bleeding. If all of a sudden someone's like, oh, I'm constipated, and there's a mass in their belly. If they can't pass even gas, that's pretty worrisome. Now we're talking about a, const a constipation that we we use the term obstipation. Nothing can come out. If they're vomiting, if they have a fever, if they've been losing weight, and if there's a family history of colon cancer or inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. So that's when you would want to bring your loved one to the doctor to say, hey, this is constipation, but it's probably something more. There might be something more there that we're worried about, like um, obstipation certainly is a big problem, or like, you know, a, a new change that might mean maybe there's a, a colon cancer somewhere, okay? We're not going to talk about these serious ones today. Today we're going to talk about your everyday, run-of-the-mill, much more common, just general constipation, but you should be aware that there are things that would make you say, hmm, this needs more of a workup. Okay, what about stool color? Well, actually, stool colors, are these colors coming through very well? I think my, oh, I guess so. I have to stand up on my toes because you know when you look at the screen, if you look at it at an angle, and I'm too short to see. <laughs> Everything looks gray from where, from where I'm standing. Um, so poop has a big range of normal colors, and it doesn't really mean anything. So um, like anything in the brown family is usually pretty normal. Um, and even anything over here can sometimes be okay. Um, Sometimes, has anybody ever eaten beets and then looked at the color of their poop? Okay. There was a really funny, was it Saturday Night Live skit where somebody calls 911? And, and they're like, I just pooped and my poop is all red. And the person at the other end is like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Did you go out to dinner yesterday? And they're like, yeah, I did. But what does that have to do with anything? He goes, did you have goat cheese? in your salad? And they're like, yeah, I did have goat cheese in my salad. And they're like, were there beets? <laughs> it was just a stupid Saturday thing. But then every call after that, so then they hang up the phone because it was like somebody who had a beet salad, you know, because nobody eats that at home. You only eat that when you go out. And it always has goat cheese in it. 
And then, like, the next caller was like, my house is on fire. And they were like, have you eaten beets? <laughs> and they're like... And they're like, oh, yeah, it must be the beets. Okay, um, so even these colors can be normal, and a lot of times medicines can do this. Um, I've been called like, oh, my God, my stool is completely black. I'm like, did you take Pepto-Bismol yesterday? Oh, yeah. Okay, is your tongue black too? Oh, yeah. So, like, certain things will do this. Um, if your stools stay black, we worry about um, ulcers or bleeding, Um, And black, black stools that if you're also having ulcer symptoms, that's like digested blood can look like that. And then these colors like clay and citron, lime, I don't know. Um, That can be unhealthy. It can be like a liver problem or something. But there's a lot of colors that your poop can be that are normal. Um, But if you do see like, whoops, let's do this one, like streaks of blood or streaks of red, we do worry that that could be like hemorrhoids or bleeding in the lower part of your, of your intestines if you haven't eaten beets. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and I just read a thing about beets that now, did you read this, Kamal? That they're so high in nitrogen, they're using them to um, prevent contrast-induced nephropathy after, uh, yeah, okay, and another part of, yeah. Okay, anyway, this is the take-home message now, because I told you people like to know, just tell me what I need to know, right? The most important thing about constipation is whether the person, I'll say you, but I don't mean to say that you're, I'm not, you know, that you're happy, right? If you're comfortable, like, it's not a competition, you know? Like, if, although I I do like a good competition. But if, like, your friend says, oh, I poop twice a day, and you only poop every other day, as long as you're happy, you know, you're comfortable, that can be your normal. That's the goal. Like, I don't need you, despite, like, the definition that I showed you, like, we consider it constipation if it's less than three poops a week. If you're pooping twice a week, but that's been your thing, and you're a healthy person, and you're eating well, and you're making good decisions, like, and that's up to me whether or not your decisions are good. You can check with me, because <laughs> I get to say that. Um, then, you're fi- then you're fine. That's the goal. There's no evidence that people who poop daily are healthier. They're just more competitive. That's all. Okay, Um, and we all know what the symptoms are when you're constipated, right? You're passing hard stools. You can lose your appetite. This guy looked very bloated to me, so I thought he would be a good. Okay, the workup for anything in medicine is history, history, history. It's like real estate, right? Location, location, location. It's history, history, history. 95% of the diagnosis of pretty much anything Except maybe in dermatology. But even in dermatology, it's history, history, history. I moved here to Hawaii um, a long time ago, like decades ago. And like two days later, my entire face was completely red and blotchy and swollen. And it was going down my neck a little too. And I got this emergency visit with Carla Nip Sakamoto. Now, like, you have to, like... Like, to see Carla Nip Sakamoto, you have to be, like, the president of the United States. Um, But I got into her clinic back then, thank goodness, because then I was one of her patients. And look, right? Look, right? Fabulous. She does fabulous work. Um, Anyway... So I walk into her, her office, and I'm like, I, you know, like my face just... And she looked at me, and she said, did you eat a mango yesterday? And I said, listen, I don't care what I... Like, look at my... And she's like, did you, like, take the seed and, like, try to get, like, that last good bit of, like... And I'm like, how did you... You never even... You didn't even ask my name. I'm like, how did you know that? Yeah. History, history, history. Like, it's the asking the right questions. Yeah, I ate a mango. I'm allergic to the sap. She figured it out. Okay. Then, right? Am I, I'm not the only one, right? Come on. Who else here had a... Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you for backing me up here. Splotchy. Like, 
complete. And then, you know, like you wipe your face and it was a good mango. Okay. History, history, history. Sometimes you might even go to the doctor these days and say, like, I went in, he talked for me to me for like 20 minutes, never even examined me. Guess what? That's still 95%. We don't really get that much more in general. So for most diagnoses, it's history, history, history. Okay. And then physical exam. I wrote plus or minus a rectal exam because you're not going to do a rectal exam on everybody every time, you know, just if somebody. But there are two reasons not to do it. That's like pretty much for people in the hospital. Then a good medication review, which really is kind of part of the history. And then specialty tests on an individual basis. I'm going to say so rare. So rare do we really need to do more testing. History and physical exam and med review is going to give you 99.9% of your diagnoses. Um, Anyway, what causes constipation? Um... You name it, right? Like I said earlier, anything that affects the human body affects the gut, right? So people can have just a sort of a predisposition to having slow transit through their system. And you'll know this after Thanksgiving. You'll see when the corn comes out. So you'll know, like, are you a one-dayer? Are you a four-dayer? How's your transit? That's the corn test. I wrote insufficient water consumption But I got to tell you, and you'll see later, we don't really know if this is true. Um, Like, we tend to say, oh, you need to drink more water. But there's no, we don't really have proof that that actually works. And because we can't test it on big populations, it would be um, unethical at this point to deliberately dehydrate people and then not deliberately dehydrate other people. So it's just kind of... um, One of these things we think we know, um, uh, like, just, what would you call that, Kamal? You know, like, things we just think we know historically. Like, like a Bubba Misa, my grandmother would say. Like, you know, your grandmother knew it. Um, Changes in diet or a highly Western diet. Like, this is a junk food diet, you know, like, eating too much, you know, not, you know, not enough vegetables, not enough roughage, um, too many processed carbohydrates, which are delicious, I have to say, and who wouldn't want to eat that? Uh, not enough physical activity. Uh, your gut knows. Your gut knows if you haven't been working out, your gut's like, why should I work out? Um, diseases such as we talked about um, this uh, sexually transmitted disease of pregnancy or other dis- chronic diseases, many medications, uh, psychological causes, like the gut and the brain. If you take home one thing today, the gut and the brain are incredibly tightly linked. In medicine, we call this the little brain, the one up here, and this is the big brain, And just like I said, like, you know, like sort of like wisdom, you know, like kind of community wisdom or family wisdom, like even in our language, it's baked into our language. You know, when you have a feeling about something, you know it where? In your gut. When you have a feeling about something, it's a what feeling? I got a gut feeling about it. Yeah. Yeah. Your gut is your big brain. And I will prove that to you today when we're, yeah. Oh, my God, I'm going too slowly. I got to go. I'm having a good time. And um, Okay. Okay. Three main types of constip- chronic constipation, slow transit, which a lot of people have, uh, irritable bowel syndrome with constipation, and, okay, and disordered defecation. Really, most people have just, um, like, either slow transit or some people have irritable bowel with constipation. And the difference is slow transit is just takes you a really long time like to move things through the system. So you might only poop, you know, twice a week. And the irritable bowel has the pain issue with it. So that's people get recurrent abdominal pain. And usually by the time you're older, you know that you're one of these people. And it's 
oops, it's this one, irritable bowel with constipation predominant. And now that we have all these commercials on TV for drugs, we all know irritable bowel because now there's commercials about it, right? Because now we never talked about like poop or erectile dysfunction or constipation or psoriasis. And now all of us, like, we know the drugs for it because they're on TV all the time. You watch Wheel of Fortune, you could be a physician. Okay. Um, Okay. So many diseases are associated with constipation, meaning like it's not actually a disease of constipation, but anything that affects the, the body affects the gut. So people who have diabetes when they, like after a while of having diabetes, may notice that they're constipated. Hypothyroidism. People, um, anybody with renal failure, and especially people that on dialysis, Parkinson's disease, obviously since the gut is a part of your neurologic system, your nerves, anything that affects the spinal cord is going to affect the gut. Um, And then any kind of like, um, like uh, connective tissue diseases and cancer, and once again, pregnancy. Um, medications that cause constipation are everything. And yeah, everything. But you also need to be aware that over the counter medications can seriously cause constipation. So things that you might take for cold and flu, thinking you're helping your nose are going to also affect your gut. And also, just as an aside, if they're affecting the big brain, they're going to affect the little brain. So I need you to be really careful with over-the-counter cold and flu preparations. Um, uh, This one is a big one. People who have um, maybe urge incontinence try to get something just to affect, you know, the bladder so that the bladder doesn't, you know pee too often, and if you're going to slow down anything in the body, you're going to slow down the gut. So the other take-home message is if it affects the body, it's going to affect the gut. Okay, let's talk about treatment. So um, I think the easiest thing to talk about is lifestyle, right? So first of all, I'm going to tell you to drink more water while I'm also telling you that I have no proof that it works. But I think there's enough, like, sort of collective community knowledge that we think that it's important. Also, as we age, we tend to have more volume depletion. We tend to be drier anyway. So unless you have a reason to not drink more water, and there's a couple of conditions that arise as we get older where doctors say, yeah, limit your fluid intake, then I would say, especially living in Hawaii, drink more water. Um, Timing your toileting making sure that, like, after you, if you really want to poop, after you eat your breakfast, you make sure you save that time after so that you can, um, you know, sit down and have a nice bowel movement. And actually, it's interesting. I gave this talk once before, and it was in the morning, and a woman came up to me, and she said, yeah, like, coming to this talk messed me up because I usually use this time I have my cup of coffee and my breakfast and at like 8, and then at 8.30, I'm pooping, but I had to be coming here. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. That's so ironic. Um, Like I said earlier, I don't want you to strain. Like, if you're straining, talk to your doctor. Let's do something else. And then does anybody know what this thing is over here that she's – it's advertised on TV and – Anybody? Yes? It's the squatty potty because body mechanics are important. And so like getting, now I don't think you're allowed to get your hips down this low if you've had a a hip replacement with a, um, so you have to talk, if you've had a hip replacement, you have to make sure that you've either had an anterior or lateral approach. Um, But Ask your orthopedic surgeon if you're allowed to get your hips down lower than your knees because you don't want to dislocate a hip replacement. But if you're allowed to do that, then this is a good body position for uh, the right mechanics for having a good poop. 
I just came back from Nepal, and the people there squat very, very low. Yes, okay. From where? Nepal. Nepal. Oh, my gosh. We have to have coffee together. Okay. (laughs) Tea, but yeah. And other lots of Asian countries, people there don't sit on Western toilets where your knees may be like lower than your hips or your... Um, they don't have as many problems with pooping and they've got much stronger legs and they squat a hole in the ground and they... Oh, I'm doing it in this dress. Okay. Yay. And they squat. Um, exercise, regular meal times. The... Uh, you might notice that there's like time is coming up, like regular meal times. Movement is coming up. That's going to be a recurrent um, theme um, because the gut is related to the brain, and the brain and the gut both live on a clock, right? You know your brain's on a clock, right? You wake up at a certain time, right? Your brain activates at a certain time. At a certain time, you get sleepy, right? At a certain time, you want meals, Remember, gut and brain linked. Um, And you have different centers in the brain that respond to um, time, to light, to and tell the body to poop and to eat. And you know how they say if you're having trouble sleeping, you should get a certain amount of sunlight every day. It resets your pineal gland, your suprachiasmic nucleus, and when it's all in balance, you poop and everything works. But if you're not on a regular schedule of either eating or getting sunlight and waking and sleeping, you're also going to mess up your pooping. Um, And I don't have a lot of slides. I don't have any slides about it, I'm sorry to say, but not just, oh, thank you, not just um, timing, but We're learning more and more every year, and I'd love to have a a lecture that I'd love to listen to a lecture about it, is like all of this is related to the the bacteria and the microbes that live in your gut and on your body, that actually changing your sleep cycle actually changes your microbiota, because all of us think like, oh, I'm one person, I'm Sherry. I am not. I am actually a moving, living, breathing community of me my bacteria, my yeast, my everything, and we're all living together to make it work throughout the day. You know that saying, like, it takes a village? We are each a village. Yeah, we're each a village. Like, you would not be alive were it not for your own bacteria who are doing a lot of the work. Okay, so um, more about treatment. Obviously, like, what you put into the system is important, so having good fiber... The kiwi guys just came out with a study that kiwi is really good for constipation. Um, And we know locally papaya is really good. My daughter takes chia seeds. They go through me like a freight train. It is not not a pretty sight. Um, And if you're not getting it in your diet, that kind of fiber we can get in medications that are designed for constipation like fiber things like Metamucil, Benefiber, Citrusel, they basically bulk up your stool, causing like your gut to stretch a little. That stretch is a signal, a neurologic signal, and and then you get more um, peristalsis, the movement of your gut, and it also pulls water into your gut so that you can have a, a normal stool. Um, with these, you have to stay hydrated, and if you're going to start these, I would start low and build up slowly because otherwise you can get kind of gassy, and while that might not be a problem for you, it's a problem for your neighbor. So whoever's sitting next to you. Stool softeners are very, very commonly prescribed. I have to tell you, there's no good evidence for them. That being said, if it's like a... So the stool softeners are like colace, Um, If you need to soften your stool because there's a hemorrhoid or you've just had like um, anal surgery like for fissures or 
like an anal fistula or something. I just came back from a mission, a surgical mission in Nepal, and we did 500 procedures for hemorrhoids and and uh, anal fissures. That like it it's a very very common problem everywhere in the world. Um, and I lumped uh, on this slide. I lumped enemas in there, but I have to say like. I think enemas should be like a last-ditch treatment. Um, if you can do something with diet or orally, maybe it's better. They do have a nice double effect that they're irrigating things out. Um, and I would avoid, and I, and, and I think the irrigation and the rectal stimulation, because there's a nerve right there that when it's stimulated, it will remind your body to poop. That's why people who have... Um, um, spinal cord injuries, and so the message from the brain can't go along the spinal cord down to their anus and their rectum. We can actually start the message from the bottom, and if they will just self manually stick their finger up their bottom to stimulate that nerve, that will trigger the nerve response for peristalsis and to poop. And so, part of a, an enema is like you're sticking something up your bottom, you're stimulating that nerve. And then you also have the effect of just irrigating something out. Uh, tap water's best. I would avoid anything of chemicals like fleets and sodium phosphates and soap suds. I don't think it's necessary. And anything that you stick in your butt, you can absorb through all the blood vessels that are down there. So... Um, stimulant laxatives. I'm going to talk about these next. So, so far we talked about lifestyle, right? Diet, exercise, keeping on a schedule, drinking enough water, eating enough fiber, right? And I need to say, that's the most important. If you're not doing that right, like, yeah. I know we're Americans, we want to pop a pill, but do the basics, right? Exercise, eat a healthy diet. I can't tell you, there's no pill on earth that is even that is invented now or that's going to be invented in the next 20 years that's going to do for you what diet and exercise are going to do. And I know that sucks because we like to just take a pill. And I'm that person too. But it's just not the same. You, you got to get up and move. You got to get up and move. Sorry. I wish there was like, you know. No, I'm not Sorry. Sorry, not sorry. It's good. You'll, you'll enjoy it. And it, it has too many other benefits for every organ system. Okay. Once that's said, okay, so now we're up to the next category of treatment for constipation, stimulants. These are very, very commonly prescribed. Probably not a great idea, right? Because these basically are kind of flogging the nervous system of your gut and they're not good for chronic use because you don't want to flog the nervous system for many years. You can get a, a situation called cathartic colon. So the stimulants are like Senna, Bisicodal, Ducalax. These are highly available over the counter. Not good for outpatient use. This is like a short-term thing. So I would say, like, if you took home an extra little point, that would be my extra little point to take home. The osmotic agents, this is like non-absorbable, like big molecules, things that you can't digest that stay in your gut and move through your system. These are really safe. Um, you can buy them over the counter, like Miralax is polyethylene glycol or uh, sorbitol. But you might also have it in your refrigerator right now an osmotic agent, and maybe you can put a little bit in your coffee, but if you put too much in your coffee, it gives you diarrhea. Or maybe there's some in your freezer under the name Ben and Jerry's. That can also be an osmotic agent. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes, milk. Right. Most people, most adults can no longer drink milk. Why? Because it's a big sugar molecule that you can't digest, so it stays in your gut because you can't break it down, so you can't absorb it. So it stays in your gut, and it pulls in water, and it gives you diarrhea. So basically, all of these are basically along the same concept. 
But worse comes to worse, like eat some Ben and Jerry's, man. That stuff is fabulous. Cherry Garcia is a gift from the gods. Um, anyway, like I was telling you, your gut is part of your nervous system. That's why you know things in your gut. Um, and we talked about part of this nervous system is, is sensing stretch in the gut. That's why if you eat something, when you eat your breakfast and you stretch your gut, like all of a sudden your, your brain knows and your gut knows, okay, it's time to, to have peristalsis, which is that blurg, 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 blurg of your gut moving. And that's why we can use this information about the fact that there are neurotransmitters or chemical messengers in the wall of the gut and chemical um, messenger, um, like receptors, to design medications. And that's why when you take medications that affect, that you think are affecting the brain, they're affecting your gut. So has anybody here ever had like, I'm sure people have been in a situation where they've had terrible acute pain, like surgery or a fracture, and the doctor gives you oxycodone, right, for your brain, right, so that you're not in pain. And what happens? You get constipated. In my case, I vomited into a garbage can outside of the ER um, next to a bunch of homeless people who were also vomiting into the same garbage can that I was vomiting into. Um, yeah, I can't do that. I will, unfortunately, or whatever, I will never be somebody who gets addicted to opiates because I can't get past the, the gut, um, things that it does. Um, so, um, the things that affect the brain work directly as well on the gut, not just opiates, but also other important brain neurotransmitters or chemicals that are designed to tell one nerve cell the information to the next nerve cell. So things that are designed for, you know, your brain is designed to use these chemicals to remember things or to use language or to move. So one of the most important neurotransmitters in the body is called acetylcholine. It might be something that you hear about in this lecture series because you might get a lecture on dementia. Is that true, Kamal? Yeah. Um, so acetylcholine, very, pro very important in the brain, very important in the gut. Anything we do that blocks acetylcholine is going to block the gut. So things like things that stop you from peeing too much or certain antidepressants or things that stop you from being dizzy are also going to make you constipated. Um, knowing these things about the gut, though, we're able to design certain um, laxatives. If you're specifically taking things that block, let's say, those receptors, like if you're taking an opiate now, they do have special drugs that were designed to work at those receptors. Um, anyway... So depending on why you're constipated, we have different targets that we can use, including those neurotransmitters, to design a drug to help you, to help you poop. But I think the most important thing is diet and exercise. Thank you. Sorry for the bad news. I wish it was a pill. And the goal is comfort. comfort. Yeah. Like... And this is a guy who just had a good poop. He's very happy. Okay, do you guys have any questions about constipation? That was kind of, we just went right through that, didn't we? Do we have any questions from our audience? Oh, okay. That was an excellent presentation. Thank you so much. I have two questions. One is, is there any relationship between constipation and chronic kidney disease? And the second is, can you take osmotics chronically? Oh, those are really good questions. One's easier than the other one. I'm taking the easy question first. Um, you can take osmotic agents chronically. Um, they don't get absorbed into your bloodstream. Mm -hmm. So... 
They should not interact with like other medications that you take, and they should probably be, if not the safest, one of the safest types of treatments. Um, yeah. And then, is there a link between chronic kidney disease and constipation? There's an association, but an association isn't a causality, right? Um, so, people with chronic kidney disease tend to be constipated. So, there may be sort of one common thing that affects both, like a common cause that affects both, but I can't think of like a causality kind of relationship. No. Um, Unless, I mean, this would be an extreme example. I have seen people get so constipated and fecally impacted that it stops them from emptying their bladder. Mm -hmm. And this is in the hospital, you know, not people just walking around. You know, I I, I don't, uh, disclaimer, I only work clinically in the hospital. So the only people I see are very, very sick people. So I don't see, like, well people who are trying to stay well. Um, Thank you. Um, so I don't, I don't think there's a causality, but there's definitely an association. Yeah. Do you rec- recommend Miralax over Metamucil? No, I do not. I am not paid by big fiber. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. Um, it, I say what works for you works for you. Um, and, uh, yeah. Um, and I would say, like, if papaya is working for you, go big papaya, right? I would totally agree with right. that. Anyone here? Yeah. A few months ago, or maybe last year, the medical school here, in one of their newsletters or something, mentioned that somebody there had been doing research on gut noise and when your stomach's been gurgling and that it was not just something to be amused by but that it, rec- it indicated Oh, like the borborygmus, we call it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and somebody was doing research on it. Do you, Kamal, do you know what they were doing research no, on? No, I haven't heard I about think that. I saw like a snippet of that and then like didn't... Um, I think a little bit of gut noise is probably um, normal. If there's a change in your gut noise, I would add that to my like, oh, something's happening, you know? I, I actually called up because I was so curious and asked if there were any recordings, but they laughed at me. <laughs> here, wait, here, you want to hear it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yes. Yeah. Okay. It's shy. It's not doing oh, anything okay. right now. <laughs> so, okay. so I didn't get any answer to that, so I'm just curious. I had to change my diet radically all of a sudden because I couldn't swallow properly, and oh. the dietitian recommended liquefying everything. Mm-hmm. And, and my stomach started carrying on like a church organ gone berserk. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I'm assuming it was because I was eating a different textured food. Yeah, and it sounds like you're working with somebody, too, to kind of figure out what's going on. Yeah, I mean, you changed you changed one of the variables. Um, yeah, but I think some people get bothered by, like, a new, like, increase in their borborygmus. Am I using the right word? Okay. Who pulled that noise, pulled that word out from the back of my brain? Um, Yeah, because it can mean like the stomach is working hard against a blockage or it's now your gut has become sort of hyperactive instead of just the normal level of activity. Um, Yeah, so if there's an increase in gut noise, like like that, that's above and beyond the normal, like, and it persists, that would be something to look into to ask your doctor about. Many people report that drinking coffee helps your movement start. They're just curious about the mechanics behind that. Oh, the mechanics. I don't know the mechanics. I think, first of all, because 
people tend to drink coffee hot. Yeah. I think there's evidence that a hot beverage hitting your gut increases peristalsis. Um, then there might be something, I mean, coffee is a very complex um, collection of chemicals. I know we talk about the theobromines in there and caffeine. Um, I don't I don't know which chemicals, chemical or chemicals, also add to uh, coffee's effect. Um, my personal experimentation on myself, it goes through me like the express bus. And, um, yeah, it doesn't stop at Kalihi. It just keeps going. Um, so I have to be careful. But for other people who are used to it, like, that's their thing that gets them going every day. Yeah. Yeah. Any others? Thank you. I got up this morning expecting a dry. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm sure shocked. I'm constipation. <laughs> and I appreciate your sense of humor. Oh, thank you. Um, I have a question about milk. Okay, there's mm-hmm. different types of milk. Okay. Mm-hmm. Do you recommend a certain type, 2%, fat-free, whole milk? Is there something that makes a sort of change uh, to help what the situation is? Thank you. Okay, that's a great question. Um, the, the molecule in milk, milk also, a big range of chemicals in milk. It's not like a one chemical um, substance. The chemical that we know about in milk that tends to cause diarrhea is the lactose, which is the sugar molecule, which is two smaller sugar molecules linked to each other glucose and galactose. Mm -hmm. So everybody's heard of glucose, right? That's one basic sugar. Then there's fructose, galactose, anybody, I can't remember any of the other simple sugars. And when they're linked together, when you link together a glucose and a galactose, you get the bigger molecule that we call lactose, which is milk sugar. And because it's lactose and it's got this link, this bond between those two sugars needs to be broken by an enzyme called lactase, A-S-E, the, the um, what do you call that part of the word? The suffix, thank you, of the word. When you see A-S-E, it's usually an enzyme. So the lactase is the enzyme that delinks the lac. The, the lactose bond between the glucose and the galactose. So has anybody here ever drank lactaid milk? Lactaid? It was a milk for a while that came out that already has the lac... Okay, there's a couple of... Can you tell me how it tasted? Did it taste exactly like regular milk? A little sweeter. <laughs> Is there like door prizes? That was... <laughs> Why was it sweeter? How many? We started with one sugar. We added an enzyme. How many sugars do we have now? Two. So it's basically, it gives the impression that there's twice as much sugar in there because it broke that bond and it gave you two sugars for the price of one. Now, That's the protein part of the milk. The fat content, I don't know. I don't have any information, or I don't know if that affects how much loose stools it gives people. Um, And I would say you could experiment with it. Um, Your cardiologist might care if you're drinking more fat. I really love whole milk in my tea. In the past, I said I drink it English style, like the way English drink it with you know, milk in their tea, and Kamal nearly bit my head off. She's like, that is the Indian style, and they stole it from us. <laughs> so, um, so now I say I drink it Indian style with milk in my tea. And so, um, and I don't like putting skim milk or 1% because it just makes it gray. So I think it's a personal preference, um, but you could play with it, and if you find out there's a difference, I'd be interested. We'll have one last question. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh. Hi. My dad is 90, 
and mm-hmm. he has diabetes, and he's tending to get more and more constipation. And what we've been doing, I'm not sure it's the right way, but if he's constipated, we generally give him like Metamucil. Mm-hmm. And if it doesn't work for a few hours, then we give him like Miralax. Mm-hmm. And if that doesn't work, we give him an enema. <laughs> Uh-huh. So I don't know if that's the correct procedure, and I don't know how long we should wait. But oh. you know, during the entire time, he's not feeling well. And, you know, it's like pretty. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, pain yeah. In his stomach and stuff. So I don't know him, and I'm today. I'm wearing my lecturer hat, not sure. my like I clinician said. hat. Yeah. But, but mm, if if I was going to problem solve that, I would probably say maybe do a little bit of the Metamucil every day instead of waiting. Okay. Because then it seems to me like you you know it's going to happen. You're yeah. telling me now, right? Yeah. So you know it's going to happen two days from now. So what? maybe just get ahead of it. Okay. And just, like, find out, like, if a little bit every day you avoid, like, the ups and the downs and just uh-huh. give it, like, a crisis-free pooping week, right? Yeah. I don't know. That That's what I would try. And prunes. I forgot to talk about prunes. Nobody even asked me about prunes. Mm. I don't know why they work. It's probably not the fiber. There's probably a different chemical in there. Yes, they work. Um, You know, and what works for him and what he likes, but I would probably just try to get ahead of it by, like, doing a little bit of something every day. I I guess when it, when it, when if that doesn't work and he has that constipation, do I? You got to do what you got to do. It sounds like he's 90 and you're still taking care of him. You're doing something right, right? You're right. You, so, like, if that's working, that's working. Maybe you want to try a little bit of more something every day before it becomes a, a crisis. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And and you know, and any of the other things we talked about, like if he can exercise, if you can get him on a schedule, if we'll he have, likes coffee. We'll have one last question yeah. from our online audience. If you have incomplete emptying, you don't finish each time, will it back up and cause problems? If you don't empty completely each time, will it back up and cause problems? Um, <clears throat> hmm. I guess that depends on how much feels like... I mean, we always... I, I hate to say this, but we always are carrying poop with us all the time. We're never completely empty. Um, I don't know. Anybody did their colonoscopy recently and had to do that prep? You must have been amazed at how much stuff came out, like horrified. I mean, just, and then sort of like morbidly curious, like where did that all come from? And then just like, like proud of yourself in a weird way. (laughs) Um, So like you're never really emptying completely anyway. There's always transit. and, And even people say, well, I haven't had anything to eat because maybe I was like, fasting for a religious reason or a medical reason. It's like, it doesn't matter. Most of your poop is bacteria, and they are still living there whether you're eating or not. It's not mostly food. Yeah, some of it's corn, but, you know, that's from last Thanksgiving. Um, so uh, I would say if, if there's a sensation, we call that tenesmus, if there's a sensation that it's still there, they might want to get that looked into because it might not even be poop that's giving that sensation. It could be like a big internal hemorrhoid or something else that should be evaluated. But you're never actually going to empty completely except like once every 10 years when you have that fabulous colonoscopy and then the best nap of your life. (laughs) (laughs) I got to say the prep has improved drastically over the years. I remember the old prep, which was way more unpleasant than the one I had recently. Right, and don't make the rookie mistake of starting out using toilet paper. No, start with baby wipes, I'm telling you, from someone who cares and someone who's been there. Start with baby wipes, because once you feel like, oh, my butt is raw, you can't go back. It's going to be raw. Baby wipes. And... uh, and if they offer you a flavor packet to put in there for the old, like, pick a fruit you don't like. Because after you spend the next 10 hours pooping your eyeballs out, you're never going to want to eat that, fr- that flavor ever again. <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. That was wonderful. I know we have more questions, but we're out of time. <laughs>